Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Collider for another exclusive interview. This time around, I am so pumped to get to talk about the Babysitter sequel, The Babysitter Killer Queen with two of the stars. We've got Judah Lewis and Emily Allen Lind here. Hello, and congratulations on another wild ride with this franchise. Hello, hello. Thank you. So, Judah, I wanted to start with you here because I really love going back to first features and kind of getting a sense of how they might have made an impression on you. And our first interview was for Demolition, and I was looking back on it the other day. Oh, so, okay. I was wondering, what do you think about from that experience and maybe specifically what it was like for you watching Jake work and how you can apply that to being, you know, number one on the call sheet with both of these babysitter movies? Completely, Yeah. Um, well, uh, there's, there's a couple pieces to that. Um, firstly, you know, I think the biggest lessons that I learned, uh, through that film, um, were from Jean-Marc Vallée, uh, the director and also from Jake and, you know, what, what they're so brilliant at is letting everything else go and being fully present in the moment as your character, you know, just really stepping into their shoes, stepping into their thought process and letting that play out and not coming into scenes or situations with a line reading or, or an intention, but really just letting it happen in the moment. Um, and in these babysitter movies, uh, it's a very similar thing, you know, they're so wild and so crazy. And so to just be fully present there and experiencing that, it's, it's all you need. And, and not only that, but one of the most fun things about babysitter films are it's so much improv. It's so much of the entire cast just riffing off of each other and coming up with things. And, and so if you're just there existing as your character, it, it, it creates, you know, this, this kind of crazy environment. Um, but it also uh, makes so much magic that you would never come up with, you know, in, in any other way. With this ensemble, I would believe that probably happens quite often. <laughs> Pretty much every take, I'd say. <laughs> so, Emily, I do have an influence question for you, too, but I'm going to save that for later when we can get into it a little more. But, you know, just on the surface here, I was wondering what it was like for you finding out that, one, you were going to get to return for another Babysitter movie, but, two, that your role in the movie was actually going to be kind of a driving force in the narrative this time around. Yeah, is this our spoilers moment? Or... No, not yet. Save that. <laughs> just right, loosely um, your first reaction. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it was great. Um, we, we did the movie years and years ago and, uh, me and Judah have sort of remained friends, uh, since. So it was really fun to come back and reprise our roles as adults and to sort of like see how much our lives have changed, but as well as the characters. Um, I think that they both deal with, uh, that night differently. I think that Melanie sort of wants to move on from it and Cole is still stuck inside of that night and what uh, and how it affects him. But they still have this amazing bond because they both went through something so terrible together and no one else believes him except Melanie. So it was really fun to, uh, to reprise our roles and, and get back into it. I can't wait to like get to the spoiler section, but first, <laughs> one of my favorite things about these movies are the movie references. So I was wondering between the two films, is there any movie that you had never seen before that you had to watch because of the script and you wound up falling in love with it? There were actually two for me. Uh, the first of which was The Graduate, which I don't know how I had never seen, um, but there's a lot of through lines yeah, there's a lot of through lines with that. Um, and then the second one is The Sure Thing, which is a Rob Reiner, John Cusack movie. Um, and there's a whole scene uh, in um, with mine and Phoebe's character, which starts out with a whole Deliverance reference. Um, but then my character goes on this whole uh, little monologue sort of thing um, in order to save Phoebe. And that entire thing is this really kind of beautifully crafted homage to um, to a scene in The Sure Thing. I think that might be one of my favorite scenes in this whole movie. Oh yeah? <laughs> Are you just watching that clip and kind of listening to his intonation over and over in order to kind of nail it perfectly? It, it, it literally, exactly, yeah. And 
And it's really fun because McGee's the kind of director where, you know, I think in every scene of this movie, there are little nods and homages to different films. But it'll be the kind of thing where, you know, before when we're doing rehearsals, before we film any scene, you know, McGee's coming up with it with his phone, like, guys, I got to show you this, you know, uh, and it's some scene or some little clip of some random movie that, you know, maybe only McGee knows about. Um, but somehow it like get called up the product. We have like the first AD being like, McGee, we got to keep on schedule. And it's literally like us watching like a 30 minute like <laughs> clip from something to be able yeah. to be on the scene. It's yeah, completely. But That's I think it adds it adds so much to the film because really whatever does. that is represents the exact tone or the vibe or a certain aspect of the scene that he's trying to emulate. Um, and that's the really fun thing about this movie is like for attentive viewers, it really is a film that like you could watch a couple times and each time pick up more and more Easter eggs. It's so true. That's that's part of the reason why over the last couple of years I've revisited that first one over and over and over. Mm -hmm. So in talking about the ensemble here, which is another one of my favorite things about these movies, I've got some cast superlatives for you guys right now. So just tell me who kind of best suits the answer to this question and then maybe why. So we know that uh, there are some pretty extreme characters on the cult side. Who of all of those cast members would you say can turn it on the quickest? They're all pretty great at doing that, which is, which is really fun to watch them delve back into their characters because I don't could never see anyone else but them playing those characters. They're so wacky. Um, I think that, I mean, I always say Batch just because he, he can just turn, turn any character on in an instant and, and kill it, really. Um, he's just so fun to watch. He's always improvising. And, that. What do you think, Judah? I uh, no, I'm. I think that I couldn't have said it better myself. I think that's a perfect. Uh, he, just, a perfect he could just like go on a rant, just to like I don't know where he's pulling it out of, but like he could just go on a complete rant about any subject and make it the most hilarious moment of the entire. Kind of the problem with working with him, though, you just can't keep a straight face. It's, you can't keep a straight face, and you'll never, you'll never be able to to beat him or, or be on the same level. It's just too funny. So I, I have a feeling that probably answers this question, too, but who's who's the most likely to kind of catch you off guard or surprise you with their improv? As, <laughs> as <laughs> Although Chris, Chris, plays Wild. Chris Wild, I know he's not he's not a part of the cult, but Chris Wild is something else. Yeah, they're my favorite, one of my favorite scenes. Uh, it was kind of cut a little bit too, uh, probably for timing and stuff like that. But like it was Batch and Chris Wild, and they like meet and they're walking to the house or whatever, and they had they just like that scene. I remember watching it being filmed, and they just like literally had. Mickey never called cut because it's just too brilliant. I want that footage. And it just like every single time that they were walking with each other is meant to be like a, hey bro, hey bro. And it ended up being like this, the best like dialogue back and forth, completely improvised. They're amazing together. They're my favorite. This kind of falls outside of my little superlative game here, but I am curious. I always like hearing about a director's tell behind the monitor when they're really feeling a take. So what does Mick G do behind the monitor when you guys are really like crushing a scene? Oh, he tells you about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but he'll also, you'll literally, when I see him, when you can't see them, you know, when they're behind the monitor and you're in the scene, but if I see him, like I'll see like a Judas scene with Jenna or something like that and I'll be at the monitor and I'll just, he'll be completely, is completely zoned into it like yes 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 like <laughs> it's so fun to see oh and then the first video will be like call it, should we call that no no and a lot of the scenes i don't even know like i want a director's cut because so many of these scenes just would like he just lets you have it like you can go some of them are like 40 minutes long if they weren't cut i would um, totally yeah. watch all of that if they ever <laughs> release <laughs> that <laughs> my favorite so back to the cast here who of the cast would actually have a fighting chance to survive a night with the cult if they encounter them? Oh. Judah. I think Judah would. I, I really, really do. He's such a little Boy Scout. I mean, honestly, Judah, I was talking about this before, but Judah, that we had this one scene when, you know, all the cult members are come back and you're in the, we're in the houseboat and 
for the wide of that scene, they didn't cut. It was like a, like a Birdman moment or something where they literally, it was just following each cult member coming, coming in. And then, uh, actually Mick G held the camera for one of the takes and, and, and totally uh, followed everyone. But Judah, every single one of those takes that he had was just lunging on the floor and lunging back and like bruising his legs. And we were feeding him like I was, we, we had this obsession with Red Bull for some reason and bangs on, on, on this set. Because it was, it was all like, night shoots because we, we wouldn't them. wrap filming yeah, until 6 a.m. every day. <laughs> I remember me and Judah, we were at the, we were at the, uh, the high school. We were shooting some of the beginning scenes and me and Judah were, really wanted to drink the, those bang, those bang energy drinks. We were so tired for the night before we were shooting or we doing a day scene. And so we literally walked on one of our breaks. We took our entire lunch break and walked to 7-Eleven in this random sketchy neighborhood <laughs> to get bangs. But yeah, we're, but Judo is just like, Judo will do any of his own stunts. He's obsessed with it. I think that he would survive the night. I, since I can't pick myself, uh, my pick would, uh, I think, be Robbie Amell because here, here are my two reasons. One, the dude is built like a Greek god. I mean, it's it's insane. And secondly, uh, so we were filming out on this lake, right? And um, it was probably like 30 or 40 degrees every night. And there was just the most chilling crosswinds and everybody was just absolutely freezing and we were all like huddled together in these warming jackets between every take and like and i swear robbie amell had to jump into this lake for a take and um i honestly i still don't know how he did it um but the dude's a warrior he also fell off in the scene that there that he's on the yes. he's on the uh robbie's on the uh tube on the back of the boat and he has no shirt on the entire film as well. Um, and he's holding on, and he literally felt like he fell off of the- he fell into the lake, yep. Into the it was all worth it. His scenes are great in this. Yeah, I know. It's time. I'm doing it right now. We're gonna go full-blown spoilers for the babysitter right now. And I, I mean, Emily, you know I'm coming right for you with this. <laughs> so this is your last warning. I'm gonna start yeah. to spill the spoilers out now. Please go check out the movie on Netflix if you haven't yet, September 10th. Go watch it, then come back. And you could pause this and actually come back and it'll start right here. So yeah. first question I have for you is, did you ever put much thought into what Melanie was going to do next after filming the first movie? And how did that compare to the spin they actually put on it for the finished film? Yeah, no, I, I mean, when I was reading the script for the first time, um, I, Mick G, I had a meeting with Mick G and he was talking about how, you know, he, he didn't want to give too much away, but he was like, I just want you to read the script, tell me what you think. And so I read it and I was like, what the actual fuck? Like, I really did not think that that would happen. I mean, it's probably the biggest turn that you can imagine, right? Um, and I think that that's why it was really important for us to get it right. And um, I hope we pulled that off for the viewers. I was I was very I was very caught off guard initially, Good. but then I was I was very impressed by how well you handled it. So, two two influence questions for you now. I promised I'd come back to that first. Is there anything that you watched uh, Samara do on the first film that you took into account here for your own spin on it? Yeah, I think that it was important to. I think that Samara kept a really calm and collected uh, sort of the entire first film. Um, and I think she was very satanic, but also at the same time, pretty sexy, um, which is hard to pull off. I, I wanted to make sure that Melanie seemed like she was trying. I mean, it's obviously like her influence was Samara's character, B. Um, and, you know, in the end, when you find out that she's only doing this for followers, it's pretty pathetic. And her character in the end is pretty fucking pathetic. Um, but I did, I did need, to, I, I did pull from, you know, the influence of Samara just because I think that, uh, I think that Melanie was definitely influenced by B. Another one I have for you, because I believe you shot this movie right before. I'm a huge Dr. Sleep fan. Thank you. And I love Rebecca Ferguson so, so much. And, you know, she is kind of like a cult leader with the true not there. So is there anything you saw her do in on that movie, on that set that you could apply here? 
I mean, Rebecca is one of my favorite people I've ever worked with. I think that she is one of the best actresses out there. Um, I think that I pull, I pull from, I mean, I'm working since I was three years old. Um, and I'm constantly learning from people around me, but working with Rebecca, I, I totally found this new sense of understanding uh, in, in acting. And I think I'll take uh, her, I think I'll take the lessons I learned from her everywhere I go um, for the future. And definitely, yeah, I mean, she's the OG, I feel like she's the OG cult leader. I don't think anyone could do it like her. I mean, her in that film is my favorite thing. I would I would not uh, argue if there was ever a True Not movie in the future. I feel like there, there's so many little pieces to Andy's story that I wanted more of. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you read the book as well, there's so, oh, good. so many little details. And, you know, they tried, their, they tried your best, but you only get like two and a half, still a long film. But I definitely think there's a lot to explore there as well. And Mike did it well. I'm just greedy because I love the book so much. I know. <laughs> I know. I would love another one too. I love that <laughs> So, Judah, having uh, dealt with, you know, so much of this the first time around, when Emily kind of got her hands a little dirtier with the blood and all the gore and all that stuff, did you have any advice that could kind of help her out with dealing with that? <laughs> it's very sticky. That's really the main thing. <laughs> I think everybody underestimates, like, yeah, no, when, when you get covered in fake blood, like, it's there to stay for a little for a little while. It's definitely one of those things where like the next week you're just like, you know, finding random blood and oatmeal and pieces of strawberry and whatever else they're missing. <laughs> you take dirt underneath the fingernails, like blood. Yeah, no, really. <laughs> We, we just did a, like a little uh, session where we learned how to apply one wound to our faces. And I think I was finding like little pieces of latex and like droplets of blood all over the place for like a solid week after that. Yeah. Yeah. So imagine like the max kill, you know, where it's just like brains on your face. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's, the, <laughs> that's the most intense of all of it because it's, it's supposed to be chunky, you know? So there's all these just random, it's literally like strawberries and oatmeal and like things like that. But um, you're, definitely, you're definitely finding it for weeks. <laughs> so I assume it's all like, it's all safe to eat and well, like you're not concerned about it getting in your I eyes. Say, it's really funny to see hair and makeup and special effects on how they talk about this blood. They make it themselves. And the way that they explain it is like, there's aloe and there's like these proteins that are perfect for your skin and it's like, like all this stuff and it's it's really it's so fascinating to see they're like they're so good at making it but it's like actually this like basic like if you put it on your face it'd be like the best nutritional mask you could do for yourself that's a new face face care regimen guys yeah Just exactly your fake blood on your face <laughs> and it's perfect for the season. Like Netflix should box that stuff up and send it out to everyone for the babysitter. Little <laughs> Halloween theme. Yeah. I would try it. Um, what about just the set pieces overall here? Now that we could talk about spoilers, is there any particular kill or set piece that on set you guys were just going like, holy shit, I can't believe this is what it takes to pull this off? They had to make an entire fake body for Bella because of that whole canyon scene with the pulling. And then also what happens afterwards, there's a boulder that falls and then there, her le- one of her legs is used to block an ax. It's just a whole progression. Um, but uh, it's honestly scary, like how lifelike those body parts are. Like really, because I pick it up to block, you know, Max's axe. And I'm telling you like, so it's a little weird. It's a little weird. It feels kind of like a leg. Like you're like, okay, you know. Um, and yeah, no, it's got like the same weight and the mass and they have this like fake skin on there. It's, it's really unbelievable. I, I don't know how, how they pull it off, how they make them, but it's, it's absolutely incredible. This is why uh, makeup effects and prosthetics just fascinate me to no end. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. When, I guess um, if we make another one, I'll have to just like go around and sit and watch them because it really is like the most fascinating things. How about doing the the ending scene where I mean they don't they don't explode, but have either of you seen um, uh, Ready or Not? <laughs> uh, yes, actually. Because like. 
Samara's in both movies, and they both kind of end with people in a like exploding or evaporating in a way. <laughs> so, Emily, what was it like doing that effect for that final showcase there? Oh, it was really fun. Another reference McGee was giving us is a Game of Thrones reference, this clip from the Red Party, um, for how uh, someone, I don't remember the character's name, but he, they drink something, it's poison, and he's just like, pull out doing this entire um yeah i've had some practice with stuff like that before <laughs> uh reference dr sleep in a sense um yeah i mean it's absolutely embarrassing in the moment you're there's nothing going on and it's just like action and you're all just you know what I mean? It's the most and yeah, and the I'm just fact, standing there watching, like, good job, guys. This huge scream at the end when I die, and it's like, yeah, but uh, it looks good now, so. It, it was well worth it for the final product. It's a movie Judah, man. My last one here is for you. You've already said The Babysitter 3, so maybe we can will it into existence, but you know, given given where things end, do you think Cole in his mind has kind of closed the book or is he permanently attached to this cult and what they've done where he's going to have to kind of like lead the charge if someone else finds the book again? Well, that's the thing. I think that uh, he's now kind of proven himself as this, you know, uh, killer of demons. Um, and so I'm sure that if there were, you know, more of them out there um, and more of them who found this book, that he would be the first in line to, to shut that down. Um, but I also think, you know, he's got to finish high school. Um, I think that there's a lot of like him and Phoebe's relationship, you know, that I'd love to further explore and where that goes, as well as, you know, in, in the end, in the final scene, we finally see, you know, him and his dad able to kind of reconnect and find an understanding for each other. Um, and so I think that would be another really interesting thing. I'm wondering what happens there. Like now that the dad believes it, will the mom believe it? Like who right. else? You know what I mean? It's weird. It could even be a good idea to have a father and son team where the mom still doesn't believe. I, oh, I think that's okay. Good. Now we're on to something. We have some <laughs> ideas here, <laughs> And then obviously the book can bring everybody back all over again. So we're all set. We got a good story. Let's make this happen. You know, once Satan involved is yeah. involved, like everything's up in the air, really. Exactly. Thank you guys so much for your time today. And again, huge congrats on the movie. It is uh, it's wild, to say the least, all over again. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. This was super fun.